hopefully that was an interesting contrast in thinking and being. You may be familiar with um, some of these meditative practices we do. The watching your breath and thoughts comes from the mindfulness tradition, which is rooted in Buddhism. And Buddhism has another practice called uh, koan, which you may know about. Uh, koan is a non-logical question, which is posed as a meditation <coughs> to a practitioner that has the potential to pop the practitioner out of their illusions and into enlightenment, becoming a Buddha, which means the awakened one. So it helps to have been practicing and contemplating Buddhist ideas for the koan to be effective. Uh, but in many ways, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's a riddle that doesn't really make sense and shocks you out of your everyday. The famous, the most famous, of course, is what is the sound of one hand clapping, right? And if this is your answer, or if this is your answer, or if this is your answer, the Buddhists probably have a name for you, and it's not Buddha. <laughs> At any rate, our theme for this month strikes me as a bit of a koan. The theme for all the Baja Four this November is one that emerges from the poll that we did last year, the survey that we did last year, and uh, comes to us from a concern for justice. And the theme is Voices of the Voiceless. It strikes me as really odd. I read this and I think, how can something with a voice have no voice? How can the voiceless have a voice? How can there be a question? The voices of the voices, of the voiceless. So this strikes me as a bit of a coin. This is our riddle. Perhaps some illumination will come our way as we reflect upon it together. <coughs> By the way, this only becomes a koan when it is read literally. When we read it literarily, as opposed to literally, I mean, I get what you're driving at, voices of the voices. I know, it, I know what that means, but when I read it literally, it strikes me as odd. Although the literary reading of it is no less problematic. You see... Because I am not only a mystic, but a cynical mystic. <laughs> I read voices for the voiceless as voices for the voiceless that we hear, that other people don't hear. Which is just a wee bit self-important. And is often accompanied by the also unstated request Please tell us how awful other people are. Uh, too often, our concern for justice is really catharsis by outraged voyeurism of the privileged. I hear a claim of superiority in this theme. Beyond this, I hear in the theme something patronizing. It doesn't sit well despite its good intentions. There is in this theme the whiff of the notion that it is we, in our enlightened grandeur, who must speak on behalf of the downtrodden. This, of course, respects or disrespects the downtrodden, those who supposedly have no voice. But folks, every being has a voice. A voice here being metaphorical, literary. Every being has an expression of itself. There are no voiceless. There are only people who do not hear them. 
And for me, the question is not, what are other people not hearing? The question is not, what is the system not hearing? Both of these questions, which seem to me to be implicit in our theme, reveal that it is, in fact, we who are the people who do not hear. Here's another koan. <coughs> what do you not hear? What do I not hear? It is a long list. Or worse, what do we hear and then ignore because it is inconvenient or just too much? Now that list makes the last list look we by comparison. Because here's the math. If every being has a voice and we don't hear it, it's because we're not listening. Our lives are either too full of the cacophonous din of the daily or we simply do not want to hear. And I suspect it's both. But I know there are things that we do not want to hear. And the weirdest thing about that is that not all of those things that we don't want to hear are scary. Not when we finally look at them. A lot of them are. Also, a lot of the voices that we can hear uh, and choose not to are scary as hell. Climate change and the resulting social and economic upheaval that has already led to refugee crises, racist backlashes against that crisis, and a stew of violence, that's scary. Just to name a current issue that is cause and effect that we may hear but not hear. The most frightening part though for me, or well for us, is the part that we are hearing but ignoring. The voice that we are muting is that which is telling us how implicated and caught up we are in producing and participating in the factors that cause most of the scary things that we are a part of. I mean, you drive here today, right? Or you own an iPhone, or you eat non-organic corn or non-organic corn syrup, which is in everything. Perhaps you're still eating industrialized cow muscle. Because you know that the climate is changing and that working conditions are atrocious and that all non-organic corn is genetically modified, which is not so bad itself, except that the associated farming practices create monopolistic economies and agricultural monocultures that put farmers out of work all over the globe and put our food supply and safety into the hands of a very few companies who use unbelievable amounts of pesticides and fertilizers made of petroleum that contaminate our air water, in combination with the immense amount of bovine flatulent methane, and the forests wiped out to support that flatulence, which heats the atmosphere, melt the ice caps, contribute to drought and sink cities. And so today, if you did any of that, you're not listening to any of it, and you know all of it. Now, we don't want to hear the voices of the voiceless, Unitarian Universalists do not want to hear these voices. We are excellent at denial. We're among the best deniers in all the four directions. We're like pharaohs, kings of denial. <laughs> well, we're so good at denial, we can deny our denial. We, we swill a little humor and indignation with a side of righteous apathy and wishful neglect. Frowny face. Like. We seek the truth 
we you use, we seek the truth until we see ourselves on the line. And not even ourselves, really. It just looks that way because we have confused our comfort with our being. We embrace the principles of liberalism as long as it is convenient. And when it is inconvenient or when we are implicated or when it is time to work, we find excuses or create defenses come up with justifications. At the end, this, like everything, is about attention. Do I have your attention? Do you want to hear the voices of the voiceless? Do you want justice? There's none of it without strain. There's none of it without pain. At least the pain of opening, the pain of, of empathy. And in the work of justice, the pain of effort is often Sisyphusian. And the only thing keeping you from hearing the voices of the voiceless is the voices of your choices. I've seen too many take an easy road, and I see them, by the way, because I'm usually on that road with them. Now, fortunately, there is a more fundamental problem beyond the political uh, or environmental or social. I say fortunately because this is a problem that can be addressed directly and immediately. Today. Right now. And not only that, but because it is fundamental, its solution may well be a key by which we learn how to open ourselves to those more particular and systematic manifestations of our denial. So here is the premise. As we've already considered, nothing is voiceless. The premise is that everything has a voice. Here's the problem. We are not only in denial and ignorance of some disturbing and inconvenient particular truths, we are deaf to almost all the life around us. Where everything has a voice, we wind up rendering the whole world voiceless. To the exclusion of our living, by and large, we hear only ourselves. <clears throat> that is the fundamental problem. Changing that is the key. For in the choose your own adventure tale that is our lives, this choice is fundamental and a cascade of consequences flows from it. Let us do a simple experiment. It requires us to return our minds to that quiet space, so at the risk of double dipping in the meditative fondue, I'd like to get you back to that state we were in earlier. So do the drill. Get comfortable. Take a deep, deep inhale. Let's clear some things. Let's take a deep, deep inhale together and a full, powerful expulsion of air. And then let your breathing find a comfortable rhythm that guides you into a state of rest. Maintaining that mental spaciousness. Open your eyes and look at somebody else in the room. Could be the person next to you or someone across the way. 
anybody. As you look at that person, ask yourself this question. Are you really seeing the person that you are looking at? Or are you rather seeing your thoughts about them? Now, voice can be thought of as the expression of being. Are you really hearing their voice? Or are you rather hearing your own voice about them? Are you seeing them, or are you seeing your thoughts about them? Okay, so you can stop staring, because we don't want <laughs> to freak anybody out to the point of legal action. See, I think most of us, uh, I know I do, see our thoughts about them, and most of us do not see people or anything else, for that matter, as they really are. It is though we see our dream of them, as though we are looking through a dream. Indeed, I'm not even sure that it is entirely possible for us to see somebody else as they are. I don't know that it's possible. I don't know that it's possible not to see our thoughts. I don't know that it's possible not to see our dream. But when that is happening without awareness of it, we have completely abdicated our own agency, our own fundamental freedom. When all we see is our automatic dreaming, we have not only not heard the voice of another, we have not only rendered them voiceless, but we have done the same thing to ourselves. <clears throat> by seeing only the dream, by seeing only our thoughts about all that we come across, without being aware that that is what we are seeing, it effectively removes us from our own lives. We make ourselves voiceless. Voices of the voiceless. It's us. And if we obscure and somnambulize ourselves, of course we will do the same to everything else, particularly if it presents us with some work, discomfort, or pain, which it will, inevitably. Because being asleep is easy. And it's not so easy to wake up. It's not so easy to stay awake. But it's worth it. And the world needs it. Ironically, the way out is not so much to become aware of others. As I said, I think that may indeed be impossible. Rather, I think the way out may well be to pay attention to our own projections, to pay attention to the thoughts that overlay all that we see. To pay attention to yourself is the way to stop hearing only yourself. So perhaps this unravels our koan, even as it presents some others. How can something with a voice have no voice? When we hear the dream without knowing it's a dream, when, when we mistake ourselves for reality, that's how. It's a mistaken perception that leads to our own ignorance and ignoring or not perceiving voices not only limits the other, but more profoundly it limits ourselves. It limits our power, it limits our goodwill, it limits our world and our effectiveness, it limits our understanding, 
and it limits what precious little agency we have. And it limits our ability to listen. So your mission, should you accept it, is this. Begin looking at what is around you with that crucial question in mind. Are you seeing it as it is or are you seeing your thoughts about it? And I can tell you that since I wrote this sermon, I've been doing this and it's not easy. But every now and then I catch it. And, and then it's, it's actually fun. Are you seeing whatever you see as it is or are you seeing your thoughts about it? I suspect that the answer will always be that you are seeing your thoughts. But I'd put it as a question. Anyway, I think it makes for good practice. Maybe start with once a day. Stop, ask yourself this question. Are you seeing what is or are you seeing your thoughts about it? And should that prove revealing or enticing, let the practice grow. As you become more proficient at it, see if you can discover then your blind spots. See if you can discover with these new muscles that you've been developing, where you are in denial. Now, one does not simply uncover, confront, and overcome denial in a moment. It takes practice, patience, perseverance, and intention. By noticing the dream view that you take for granted, it may become easier to notice the dream view that blinds you to other more challenging aspects and implications of your living. By practicing and building up to it, you may find that one, it is easier to discover your denial, and two, that you have in fact developed the muscles to deal with it. When you do discover your blind spots and denial, don't feel compelled to rush in. You don't have to immediately fix it. That backfires in a way because it encourages the projection of thought, which is the thing that you muted and so were able to see it, right? So you don't have to fix it. Just notice it. Start with just noticing it. We're always seeking to fix things and little pains that we have or problems in our life, but Often all that's necessary is noticing it. I've been practicing that on little aches and pains and headaches that I have. I don't try to relax the tension point in my back, I just notice it. And it goes away. It's weird. It's not a guarantee, but. <laughs> don't worry about getting over denial, just notice it. And when you are ready, because you are practiced, just notice it. Watch your denial without judgment and see what you do. See what it does and see how you transform. Just watch. Now, I know many of you are having a hard time thinking that you are in denial or thinking about what you are in denial of, and perhaps thinking straight up that you are not in denial. <laughs> to which I say rather smugly, exactly. 